Hello everyone. Welcome to this screencast on D-band theory of metals. My name is Jimmy Faria. And today in this screencast, uh, what I would like you to take home is a very simple way to visualize the formation of electronic bands and metals and how to infer the density of electronic states in the metals based on the electronic structure of the isolated atoms. So remember when you have a uh, single atom, you have discrete energy levels where the electrons might uh, be located. And these are called these atomic orbitals. When you have now two atoms in the system, these atomic orbitals are split into molecular bonding and antibonding uh, orbitals. As you increase the number of atoms in the system, what happens is that the energy difference between these different levels or molecular orbitals decreases. Decreases to the point in which now this becomes a continuum of energy levels. And that leads to the formation of electronic bands. Now, the moment in which you have bands, you also have the possibility to have gaps. In essence, what happens is that as you reduce the interatomic distance, that is, as we saw before, the formation of these infinitely dispersed energy states, and depending on the material properties, you could have overlap between two different bands or a gap. And that drastically affects the properties of the material. So, for instance, if you have a metal such as copper, in which you have a valence band that is partially empty and partially filled, so electrons can move into these empty states in the valence band and move freely to have electrical conductivity. In the case of magnesium, for instance, what happens actually is that the conduction band and the valence bands are overlapped, and as a result, electrons can move freely in the conduction band. So you have electrical conductivity. In the case of semiconductors, what happens is that you have a relatively small band gap of below two electron volts, and electrons, if are provided with sufficient energy, can jump into the conduction band to have electrical conductivity. In the case of uh, insulators, what happens is that the energy uh, required is extremely large, it's above two electron volts, and as a result, electrons really cannot jump into the conduction band to have electrical conductivity. The density of states. So as we said before, we have our energy block diagram in which we imagine this infinitely uh, large number of energy states that are spaced by infinitely small energy differences. In reality, when we have the projected density of states in the system, what we have is an electron density or a distribution of electrons as a function of energy. So you actually have a curve that looks something like this, depending on metal structures. The density of a state, or the projected density of a state, it is, is defined as the number of energy levels per differential of energy in the system. The shape of this distribution depends on the electronic properties of the material. Typically, the S-band is quite broad and shallow in density and very broad in energy because it's very close to the core of the atom, while the D-band is much more pronounced in terms of density of states. The firmer level is defined as the maximum level of energy that is occupied by electrons. So basically these electrons that are right here are those that can do bonding with other adsorbates. Let's look at an example, for instance. So here we have rhodium. The electronic configuration of rhodium 
it's right here. And what you see here is that the D shell is partially filled. So when we look at the S and the band, what we would expect is actually the firmer level to fall somewhere across the D band in such a way that now we have a partially filled D band and a partially filled S band. Let's look at another example now, an S metal, such as silver. What you see here is now that the D shell is actually filled and the S shell is partially filled. What that tell us is that the Fermi level has to fall somewhere across the S band. And that is exactly what happens. You have the Fermi level falling somewhere above the D band. So the D band is completely filled and the S band is partially filled. In order to determine this uh, experimentally, we use a technique called ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy that is based on Koopman's theorem in which the binding energy of electron in the I state is equal to the negative of the orbital energy of that I state. So basically what means is that we can actually infer from the energy of the electrons what is the binding energy that they have. In order to do that experimentally, what we do in this technique, please look at right here in the right hand side, is that we send photons with an energy that it's around 21 electron volts. And these photons interact with electrons that are in the valence level. So these are basically near the firm level. These electrons are excited from, from their ground state into the vacuum with a particular kinetic energy that we can actually measure here with a detector. And this all happens in vacuum. When you look at the plot that you obtain, you actually have here the number of electrons, so how many electrons have been counted as a function of their kinetic energy. So you start looking at the kinetic energy as a function of number of electrons, and you have here, for instance, a D metal, and then you have a very large secondary electron that are basically those electrons that inestically scatter during this interaction. So what you have here is that the binding energy of that electron will be equal to the energy of the photon that you sent plus the energy of the kinetic, the kinetic energy of the electron that have been detected, Ki. This information is key to build these diagrams in which we actually can use the information from the UPS to build the density of states. In addition to that, we can also determine something that is called the work function, which is also relevant for thermionics. And the idea here is that actually what we want to measure is the width of these uh, of the density of states. So to do that, we subtract the inelastically scatter uh, electrons and we obtain this normalized spectrum. And what we do is we determine the width the energy width that you have in this spectrum and that energy width and the uh, energy of the photons that you uh, bombarded the sample with will give you the value of the work function. Now let's take a look at some examples. So what you have here is rhodium and silver and the question is can you see the D and S bands? So in the case of rhodium and silver, you can see clearly here are the two D bands. And in the case of silver, we also have an S band. Interestingly, there is something right here that happens near the edge at the firmer level. What you would expect to see is that this is a flat line but in fact, this almost looks like a progressive 
a change in the density of a state of a function of the binding energy. The question is why? So experimentally, you cannot measure this at zero Kelvin. Instead, you have sufficient temperature for electrons to move above the Fermi level surface, reaching out, depending on the temperature, all the way to the conduction band. And the reason for that is because the Fermi level electrons are actually a function uh, the energy of the thermal level electrons is a function of the temperature of the system. Now let's take a look at our last example. What you have here is nickel, copper, and zinc. This is remember our thermal level at zero, and now we have we have flipped the image on the other side. So binding energy increases in this direction. Now the question is, can you determine First, where is the D band located? And second, what is the energy difference between the D band centered and the Fermi level? So, to give you an idea, what would be the distance between D centered and the Fermi level? So in the case of nickel, we can see that this will fall right here, very close to the Fermi level. In the case of copper, that value will fall a little bit above the Fermi level. And in the case in SIG, it, it's quite clear that this is very far from the Fermi level. The reason why this is so important it's because you now realize that the electronic structure of the isolated atoms already tells you a little bit about how will be the electronic structure of the solid material. So if you have, in this case of zinc, you have a completely filled S and D bands, while in the case of copper, it partially filled S, while in and finally, in the case of nickel, this is partially filled D band. The reason why this is so important because depending on the this the energy difference between the center of the D band and the Fermi level, you have a trend in catalytic activity and that varies across the periodic system. The key to understand this is the following. If you have a fraction of empty states and occupied states, you now have a first empty states where you can accept electrons and form a hybridized molecular solid orbital. The moment in which the center moved farther down from the Fermi level, What happens now is that you have a smaller fraction of empty states to do bonding. This is the key for having more or less interaction with an adsorbate. So I hope that you have enjoyed this video. And of course, you also keep in mind that this is a very basic introductory video on D-band theory. Thank you very much.